words, and I am raising my cup of coffee to you because it's <laughs> Um, do you have a beer or a glass of wine for six o'clock your time? Uh, I, I have a humble glass of uh, water at the moment. So. Wow, you're not in the spirit of this at all, but maybe. <laughs> There's <laughs> still time. <laughs> all right. So I wanted to talk to you about two things today, Martin. One of the things I wanted to discuss was the British Library Crime Classics for obvious yeah. reasons. Yeah. But then, um, you have a new book out in the UK called Mort Main Hall, which is the I do. Sequel. Yep, the sequel to Gallifreyport. That's and right, and this is the British edition, I do I can't show you the American edition. <laughs> hold it up again in front of your face, will you? So we could just catch it for a minute. There we go. That's really nice. Okay, beautiful yeah. color. Yes, right. it is. So as background, you did a very nice interview with Michael Barson, which I have printed out, um, and I thought it had some great questions. So I'm going to read one, and let's talk about it. Um, your own recent novel, The Well-Received Gallows Court, was set in 1930, the same period as one of the British Library crime classics, Castle Skull, that you like. Is the decade of the 1930s your own ground zero favorite of British mysteries? And if it is, why? Well, um, I, I chose 1930 for Gallows Court and, and, and also Mortmay Hall for a, for a special reason. It, it seems to me to be a, a kind of landmark in the, uh, in the history of detective fiction. The Golden Age had been going on for about a decade then. And the, the early books, the Golden Age books, were very much in the game tradition, the puzzle, the challenge to read it, can you solve the mystery? 1930 saw some very significant developments. There was um, the first Miss Marple novel, Murder at the Vicarage. There was the book in which uh, Lord Peter Whimsey meets Harriet Vane, Strong Poison. There's Anthony Barclay's The Second Shot, and the Detection Club was formed. So, um, so uh, quite apart from a number of other significant books, uh, John Dixon Carr made his debut and, and various others, it seemed to me that 1930 was, was really a landmark. And so it, it seemed right to pick that as the year when, um, when Rachel Savonek's uh, uh, career would uh, come into being. So in terms of the British Library crime classics, what general key of range of dates have you selected for um, your criteria? Well, well, classic is, is one of those words that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So it gives us quite a lot of latitude and flexibility. And the, the, the way it's worked out, the, the period of the books runs really from the uh, uh, late 20s right up until the 60s. Uh, so so it, it, it goes beyond the uh, traditional confines of the Golden Age. But even within the Golden Age, even before the Second World War, the, the variety of books that were published in that time was much, much wider than, than critics have often suggested. And one of the things I'm very keen uh, to see in the series is, is to showcase that, that diversity of type of story. So you have um, not just John Bude, uh, and DCR Lorac, but you also have um, Richard Hull uh, and um, Anthony Rolls, people like that, Anthony Barclay. So, so there's quite a range of different styles. You have comedy with Alan Melville. Uh, so so the, the sheer variety of book that was coming out at that time seems to me to be one of the attractions of the period. And one of the things I'm very keen to, uh, to see reflected in the British Library Crime Classic. Well, we you and I have talked about the upper range of dates and picking into the 1960s is kind of your level of tolerance. But going the <laughs> other direction, um, are you doing books from the 1920s or is 1930 kind of your jumping off point? There have been a few books in the uh, 20s, but, uh, but I think the way that it's, uh, it's worked out, it, the, the majority of the Golden Age books, the, the vast majority in the series so far have been in the in the 1930s. Uh, and I, I thought I, I would show you an example. This is uh, a first edition of uh, Murder in Piccadilly by Charles Kingston, one of the very first books in the series. Uh, uh, not a very well-known author at all, but, um, but he was one of those uh, uh, 
uh, popular writers who were around at the time and uh, and that particular book featured in the series uh, uh, quite early on. I have with me a copy, an advanced reading copy of the July book, which is yeah. called Death in White Pajamas and Death Knows No Calendar. Now you've done several books by this author. Yes, well, well, John Bude was was the the author who who really represents a bit of a milestone for the series because there had been a few books published that that didn't do particularly well, and and then. Um, the British Library decided to shake things up a bit and, and introduce this idea of the railway poster covers, the artwork, uh, and, and hired me to write some introductions. And the first one I wrote was the Cornish Coast murder, uh, and then the introduction of the Lake District murder. And um, to my surprise and everybody else's surprise, those books uh, did, did really well. Uh, the covers became quite iconic, really, uh, and, uh, and the rest is history. I think the covers are a really crucial part. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Remember Ab in absolutely. London, I think maybe three years ago, on my way to Stockholm to trip around Sweden and Norway, I went into Hatchards in Piccadilly, which has always been one of my favorite bookstores. Yeah. And they had an entire very large table. With, yeah. At that point, all of the British Library classics, which of course is way fewer than we have now, and mm. they collective impression of those gorgeous covers really smote me and clearly mm. was leading, you know, to their sales. So yes, I absolutely right. I hope you're not going to run out of posters, but um, <laughs> but they are terrific. And, you know, we've yeah. had a more difficult problem finding a cohesive cover look for the Library of Congress crime classics. Mm. I'm going to be talking to Leslie Klinger, the editor of that series, about that mm. uh, fairly soon and so we you know you're, you're so lucky in this really poster body I think to make it work. Um, another question I have is uh, well I have two. Um, what about the puzzle element? That That is something that um, you know the concept of the fair play mystery but also the puzzle yeah. element was an important part of the golden age. Yeah, oh yes. Um, in fact, you have introduced something in the main hall called the Free Finder. So why yeah. don't you tell us all about that? Yes, well, well, it goes back to this idea of the detective story being a game uh, between the writer and the reader. And it, it really uh, took off after the First World War, uh, when you have the likes of Agatha Christie uh, coming along with the, uh, uh, the specialist who done it writer. Uh, and and some some authors, both both in Britain and America, actually had a formal challenge to the reader. Ellery Queen, of course, uh, was very keen on the challenge to the reader. So so the the idea was that the author should play fair with the reader and and put the clues in the story. But of course, it was important to. Um, uh, not only to play fair with the reader and put the clues in, but also to misdirect like the conjurer so that solving the puzzle wasn't too easy and become boring so um, so that was something that that writers like uh, Christie excelled at Anthony Barclay was another who was uh, a brilliant uh, divisor of puzzles and one thing that a number of authors uh, uh, decided to do and uh, Freeman Wills Cross was was one of the early exponents uh, was the idea of the clue finder so that at the end of the book um, the reader could see a summary of the clues in the text which had been given but which he or she might not have noticed uh, and and some authors put the clue finder uh, uh, elements in footnotes uh, others uh, had a separate section at the end of the book and the the American psychiatrist uh, C. Daly King uh, uh, really went to town with the uh, the clue finders. And he had incredibly lengthy and elaborate clue finders with lots and lots of clues, which are really quite fascinating now when you when you read them and look back. And so, my idea with Mort Main Hall was to revisit the idea of the clue finder uh, because it's it's not really something that's been done for sixty or seventy years. I think possibly Edmund Crispin was was about the last. Um, a golden age writer to to have a clue finder. John Dixon Carr was another. So uh, so in Mort Main Hall, right at the end, there is a clue finder, and there are thirty four clues. So um, the question for the reader is, how many of them did you spot? 
Wow. So in a way, what you're doing is unpicking the structure of the, uh, of the mystery, the detection process, yeah. so that the reader can go back, which requires, it certainly goes against the concept of many of today's thriller writers and all, which, who call themselves cancers rather than plotters. Um, it would be very difficult to do a quick one if, um, if you yes. weren't, in fact, a plotter, you know, and making that work out. So, that, um, that, that's, that's certainly true, although, of course, as, as you're writing a book over a period of time, more ideas come to you. So, so even if you're writing from the seat of your pants, you, you know, you, you, you may go back and, and introduce fresh elements and fresh clues. I love that, this whole idea. Do you think some yeah. of it from an ingrained British love of both of card games, you know, things like Whistle and so forth before it came along, but but crossword puzzles. I know there's a Niall Marsh book, and I can't remember the title, where crossword puzzles is a part of the plot. So Yeah. Well 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 crossword puzzles were a big thing at the same time. It's all part of the same phenomenon. I think not just in Britain, but also in the States and, and elsewhere as as well. That uh, people uh, were interested in escapism after the war. Uh, they were interested in the idea of games of various kinds. And the detective novel became one example of a type of game. Although, of course, uh, writers like Christian Barclay and Dorothy R. Sayers were very keen on uh, trying to make sure that it's something a bit more and to try to elevate the literary standards as well as uh, uh, entertaining and bamboozling the reader. One of my very favorite things about Dorothy is I've run across it twice. In one of her short stories, the key to figuring out the plot is that you must be French because she used the wrong yes. gender. Exactly. And yes. if she, if she, if she, she expected her readers to be so familiar with French that they would pick up on that. But elsewhere, yes. I don't remember what book it's in, I think there's an entire letter or note written in French, and when she was asked whether she wanted it translated, she said no. She expected that her readers would be able to read the letter in uh, French. Uh, abs, ab, it may have been Clouds of Witness, that one, I, I, from memory, I think, perhaps. But but yeah, she, she, she was very different from Christy, because you don't need any specialist knowledge with Christy. You just need to be very alert to the, uh, uh, to the subtleties of the text. And there is a Christy. Uh, I won't say which one, where um, you, you, your eyes pass over the text and there's something that appears to be a typographical error. But really it's a clue because a name is subtly different from the name that it should be. Uh, and, and the clue is disguised typographically, if you like. I love that. Well, that's more or less what Sarah was doing. With the mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in part of it, I think, was Sarah's you know, was part of the whole Oxford culture which um, you know was a bit snobbish in terms of the education level and yeah. the yeah. alertness that it expected yeah. of this readers so the British Library and classics are are not doing Dorothy Sayers and Agatha Christie and you know you're, you're no. writers who um, who were good and possibly even great but but whose fame has not endured in the same way that these Iconic names, and I should include. That's right. Marjorie Allingham, certainly Josephine Tay, whom I most yeah. love. Yeah. You know, they're they kind of went in a natural progression to let's say Pete Holmes, possibly. Yes. Although I never bonded, I bonded with Dexter over more on television, much more than I ever bonded with the books. Yes. Um, yes, yeah. and I think many did. Yep, his voice just never worked for me in the books. So John Thaw somehow magically. <laughs> you know, in a way that um, that I didn't see. Also, you know, I, I'm a great admirer of James um, and that tradition. And I really miss Reginald Hill. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, and in fact, your late distribution, the contemporary series that I edit and we publish with friends and friends, I really yeah. in a way as a, as a kind of a, a nod, not an homage. To Reginald Hill, and even to yeah. he was still writing. Well, 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 that's right. Reg Hill was was a great friend of mine, something of a mentor, and uh, someone I, I was extremely fond of. He was also, I think, probably the wittiest person I've ever met. And 
um, shortly after I, I embarked on the uh, uh, Lake District series, he, he wrote a book called uh, The Stranger House. And he actually said to me, don't worry, I'm not going to write a series. <laughs> I was a typical reg. And uh, another book he wrote was called Killing the Lawyers. And he inscribed a copy for me saying, nothing personal. <laughs> he, was a good, he was a great guy and a fantastic writer, as you well know. He was, you know, he was a great stylist. He was wonderful on character and background. I was lucky to email with him. I don't know if I could say two years of his life. I can't remember the email kind of took over his email. But I know that we wrote letters to each other and then I think we graduated to email. And it was a real loss of vacant space when we died. Yes, yes, he, he, he was a remarkable guy and it was, it was a great, great shock because the last time I, I, I met him at a detection club dinner, he, he, was, hail, he was hail and hearty and it was, uh, it, it was a terrible blow when he fell ill and died. That's very true. Do you know the other day, cleaning my, part of, part of this um, isolation thing is I've been cleaning my office, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> and I discovered a little trove of, cassettes of um, conversations I recorded with authors who visited us. Oh, and while she oh, was, fantastic. well, it really is. I think she was three times, but in any case, in one of them, I have recorded Ellis And to me, that was actually a personal loss. In a, a very, uh, the editor of American Editor, I went to visit her in the nursing home and she was there after she had to and she never really recovered from that, as you know. But um, I have a long correspondence with her. And I'm so happy that we can hear a voice. So I'm going to have Patrick yeah. move into a podcast if we can find a cassette player. Oh, um, that would be wonderful, yeah. I think so, too. I'm, I'm going to see which other. Uh, I found a Sue Grafton one where we talked about Cincy and me. And I'm kind right. of hoping, you know, that <laughs> excavating my closet. Um, I, <laughs> But for you, the good news is I've also found um, I have quite a library of what I think of British crime classics that um, you and I have maybe talked about, but I'm going to go through them and see if I can suggest them to you. Because one of oh, the wonderful. Yeah, that'd be great. Doing this classic thing, Martin, is finding the text because a lot of these books are out of print. So how yes. do you stop that? Well, I've, I've I've been uh, a, a fan for a very long time and I've been hunting the, the uh, obscure books for a very, very long time. So, um, so I've had many years of, uh, of research and reading to, to draw upon and, and people make, make suggestions to me, but, but I've been haunting the, the secondhand bookshops for many years. That's where I found some of the Lorax uh, and uh, uh, book fairs as well. There are a lot of book fairs in, in Britain to this day, not at the moment, of course, but uh, but generally, I, I went to one in in January in York, a very good book fair. So uh, so so there are various uh, sources. There are specialist dealers uh, here as well as in the states. So so I, I find them from all all sorts of uh, uh, obscure places, and of course, the British Library itself as a as one of the libraries that that receives a copy of every book. Um, uh, can supply um, uh, the really, really hard to find titles if, if I really need to uh, uh, look there as well. How do you deal with copyright? A copyright is a thorny issue we've run into with the Library of Congress where books that you yeah. might have not yet run out of copyright. The, the British copyright law is somewhat different than the American, isn't it? Uh, it is different uh, and, and it's, it's essentially uh, we, we don't have systems of renewal of copyright in, in, in the same way. The, the principle is that copyright runs for a period of 70 years after the end of the year in which the author dies. And, and then that is it, uh, full stop. So for instance, uh, Agatha Christie is still in copyright, but J.J. Connington, who died in 1947, isn't. Uh, so to go to go directly to your question, it's the library rather than me, thankfully, who who handles all the 
uh, the rights issues and, and researching who owns the copyright, which is in itself sometimes very difficult to, to find. I, th I think they have a preference for books that are in copyright because at least they, they know that if they reach an agreement with the copyright owner, uh, then, then they have a clear run up the book for a period of years. And that's, that's clearly attractive from, from their point of view. I think a good example of, of a difficulty was um, uh, Peter Schaffer's book, The Woman in the Wardrobe, which is coming out in Britain uh, uh, in the next few months. And in fact, only today, I've been exchanging emails with Eleanor Schaffer, who was a sister-in-law. Of, uh, of Peter, but um, but uh, that's a wonderful uh, locked room mystery which Peter wrote shortly after leaving Cambridge University in his early twenties, uh, and he didn't write it in conjunction with his twin brother Anthony, whereas subsequently uh, the two of them wrote a couple more books, uh, and those subsequent books where you're dealing with the two different complex estates would be quite a challenge I think but with Peter at least we were only dealing with one estate and so uh, so the library's been able to secure the rights to republish and it's uh, it's taken about five years but finally managed it and it's a book I'm uh, I'm sure will be uh, uh, gratefully received by a lot true mystery fans. Well I asked the question because you know there may be an assumption that if the British Library or the Library of Congress wants to republish the book as a classic that they should just go ahead and do it. Um, and no. it's never something that simple. Um, no, absolutely, ab absolutely not. And that, that they are, I, I must say, um, that they are extremely careful and extremely scrupulous about these things. Uh, of course, ma major public organization would expect that. And, and they, they do take a lot of time. And, and the flip side of the coin, of course, and you, you may have experienced this with uh, with the Library of Congress is, is that sometimes it becomes very difficult to secure the rights um, because you simply can't find, uh, or maybe there's a dispute as to who actually owns them. Uh, and so it, it can take a long time to unravel these little detective puzzles of, uh, of copyright ownership. I think so too. And a question that I can't address, Leslie Klinger, like you, is a very distinguished and we'll probably break this up, but a question I have, I have contemplated is, would the prestige of the Library of Congress imprint move some copyright holders, um, you know, to license an extra edition or, or, you know, if there's one already published, could it be like a parallel publishing? And, you know, I, I don't know the answer, but I thought it was an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, my, my guess is that the, and, and I, I don't speak for the British Library, uh, uh, but my guess is that, is that they would prefer to have a degree of exclusivity over publication. And that's one reason to focus on books that are in copyright rather than out of copyright, which is fair game for, for anybody. Um, and I, I think that they, they like to reach agreements that with, with the state uh, uh, and agents that, that give them the opportunity to uh, promote the book over a number of years, prom uh, promote it and sell it in, in a wide range of different jurisdictions uh, and, uh, and in translation as well, ideally. So, so I think I, uh, from their point of view, I would imagine that ideally they would prefer to have as many rights as possible. But sometimes that is, that is difficult. I, I will show you a book where there was a difficulty. And this is the, the Arsenal Stadium Mystery. This is the original edition, uh, one of the, the gems from my own collection, uh, a football mystery, soccer mystery. And um, there was an edition of, of that book that was uh, uh, produced by a small press. And so there were negotiations, which I, I wasn't party to, but, but in the end, an agreement was reached. So I, I think the British Library uh, obtained exclusivity. Well, let's move away from the technical for a moment. I, one other question I wanted to explore with you was regionalism. Because yeah. one of the books that you are republishing as the British Library, in fact, in your own work, um, there's, there's a very geographical component, you know, a landscape, if you will. Yes. Uh, and it can be both physical and it can be cultural in some time, i.e. the village. Yeah. 
or the football mystery, which yeah, you know, except it's a, a culture. Um, I think you made a comment in your chat with Mr. Burson that American readers maybe have a preference for um, the more landscape mysteries, village mysteries, rural mysteries, or so forth. Um, do you think that's true? Well, I, 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 I guess so. And I, I, I remember you and I having a conversation many, many moons ago about, um, about my own books and comparing the Liverpool books and the, the Lake District books. And, and I, I, I think you were, you were saying to me gently and kindly that, that American readers thought of England more in terms of the Lake District rather than Liverpool, um, which, which they might think of uh, more as sort of urban place and a bit, uh, a bit Baltimore-ish, something like that. So, so I, I got the impression from you, and it, others have confirmed it. But I've discussed it since that uh, that that many American readers, and I'm, I'm sure there are many exceptions as well, uh, think of the traditional British mystery as something that is predominantly rural. Now, now whether they're uh, they're right or whether that that's just a, a particular image is, is is a different question. But 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 that's the impression that I have from conversations I've had with with a number of people. Yeah, I think it's more true of the golden age. I mean, there certainly are some very distinguished contemporary British crime writers writing urban mystery, whether it's sure. London, yeah. Liverpool, Glasgow, Edinburgh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, but then again, you have Anne Cleves writing about the Shetlands and her new yeah. book. Is it Dorset? I'm trying to remember. She's in a- Devon, Devon. Devon, yeah. okay. Um, and so, you know, I think Americans are more accepting of urban settings, but yeah. that really applies to the period that you're working on. But let's let's talk about Gallows Court and Mount Main Hall to wind this up. Um, Gallows Hall is where? It has two different locations. G G Gallows Court is, is uh, in, in the story, uh, it doesn't actually exist in real life, but in the story, it's part of Lincoln's Inn, uh, one of the four inns of court in central London where uh, lawyers practice, including, I, I must say, my own son. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's, he's a barrister in Lincoln's Inn. Uh, and um, uh, Gallows Court is located there. And the uh, majority of the action in that particular novel uh, not all of it, but the majority takes place in central London. And one of the ideas I had for these books was that the setting of each would reflect a, a particular type of setting that uh, that you came across in the Golden Age. So, so the first book, Gallows Court, is uh, predominantly London-based, uh, with one or two scenes elsewhere. And Mort Main Hall is is a uh, ultimately a country house murder mystery, although it takes uh, quite a few chapters to get to the country house. Uh, there's quite a lot of build up of the story before then, but, but I envisaged it as, as a kind of take on the country house mystery, but, but not an entirely conventional one. That was my, my uh, idea. So, so there are golden age elements in both these books, but, but I, I, I've tried to give them a fresh uh, twist and, and, and a 21st century twist because after all I'm writing the 21st century for 21st century uh, readers but uh, but at the same time paying tribute to the books and the stories and the detectives of the past and the styles of writing the past and the tropes the uh, uh, the clues the ciphers and as we were talking about before the clue finder I thought that you did an interesting thing with Mort Main Hall in the yes, it is a country house mystery and so essentially you have to have the house uh, in the same spirit as um, Rebecca, let's say. But you yeah. know, because you have this Gothic twinge to you, which I always find so interesting because as a lawyer, you're so not like that. And then when you write, it's like you are a shapeshifter. <laughs> <laughs> but awesome. what you really did was you wrote The Fall of the House of Usher. Yeah, it, it's... I, I think your your the term you've used, golden age gothic, really resonates with me because I I hadn't thought of it till you mentioned it. But that that phrase captures, I think, the mood. They they are golden age, but they're not entirely cosy. Uh, there are there's some dark stuff going on in those books. Uh, uh, but I, ho I hope some entertaining uh, stuff as well along the way. 
Well, that's one of those words where we are divided by the common language. Cozy in America means a way different thing than cozy in Britain. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. I remember reeling when P.D. James was described to me as a cozy writer. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Like, disembowels somebody and, you know, and, <laughs> and I was going, really? Cozy? <laughs> so I think in Britain, cozy really means a more traditional mystery, whereas in America, it has many more specific connotations. And I do not class you as a cozy writer in the American yeah. in any way. Uh, with the Lake District mysteries, which are really amateur sleuth mysteries, um, you know, uh, in a very British style or in um, or in the Rachel Savernig books, both Dallas Court <laughs> and Mort Main Hall. And I remember talking to you, the opening of Mort Main Hall um, is, is, brings in that very London institution, the Necropolis Railway. And yes. One of your colleagues, I can't think of his name, actually wrote a mystery called The Necropolis. It was uh, and Andrew Martin who writes the Railway Detective books. That's right, that's right. yeah. Uh, and um, I, I talked at, at some length to, because Necropolis Railway sadly ceased to be in the 1940s, so you can't research it directly. But I talked at great length to the guy who has studied it, the historian of the railway, a, a man called John Clark, who was really helpful and read what I'd written about it and made suggestions uh, and, and helped to, to give me the uh, touch of authenticity, which I think is very important in a historical mystery, that trying to, as far as you can, uh, to, to, you never get it perfect, but uh, trying to get it right, to capture the mood, what it was like in those times, even if you're writing from a 21st century perspective, for 21st century readers, I think that touch of uh, authenticity, that, that feel of, of realism, uh, even if it's only a veneer, is still, pretty important. Oh, I think it's crucial to successful historical mystery. For those of you who are wondering what a necropolis railway is, it's basically a funeral train which yeah. transported um, mourners and I think the body um, yeah. to yeah. From London out to the cemetery because there was yeah. no longer any real burial ground in central London. Although we're probably standing over plague pits when we're in central London. Yeah, yeah. Basically, in New York City, we've gone back to plague pits, you know, which is... Um, wow, wow, it's extraordinary, yeah. isn't it? It's, uh, it's quite what, extraordinary. Yeah, much of what we've talked about actually relates to where we are at the moment, you know. It's, yeah. So I, I often say that I was born in 1940, and I always felt lucky to have missed the 1940s to live through them, because it was so difficult, and here we are. Uh, Absolutely, I, you just never know, do you? But uh, it's it's quite extraordinary. And I, I was very interested in one review of Gallows Court, suggesting it was uh, uh, a book inspired by the Me Too movement. So you can see these uh, these things popping up in different uh, periods of history. We can indeed, Martin. This has been absolutely delightful talking to you. And you both. That we will do this again because both you Absolutely. and Cleves have discussed um, doing some. Uh, Zoom events and joint events. Yeah, yeah. And we'd be delighted to host them. And what we can do is replace me with Anne. And so the two of you could be having a conversation in this uh, technology, but we can bring it in here and make it available to American. So I'd be That's happy. Fantastic. And I also was going to say if there's anyone in the CWA that you would like to interview or talk to, uh, while we have this technology and people have time, you know, I'd be sure. happy to host um, some conversations, um, you know, that we can then put on our own Facebook page and then they translate all over the U.S. So for British folks who might want to yeah. reach the American market when they can't, uh, that yeah. would be great. Many of, many of them I've read and I can talk to them myself, but many of them um, I'm not so familiar with as I am your own work. And so having you talk to them, or having them pick somebody else, you know, so that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, really fun. So since you're so yeah. active in CWA, you might want to you might want to offer that up. I shall take you up on that, Barbara. Thanks very much indeed. You're welcome. I'm going to end our meeting now. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.